Thanks for tuning in. This is Stopper Be Thompin'. And in this video, we're going to do part two of the 2023 Toyota Tundra review. And just for reference, this is the limited trim with the air suspension in the rear and the basic 4x4 package. So if you haven't seen part one, I highly recommend going and checking that out. At that point, I had the truck for about 1,700 miles in a couple of months. So those were my initial impressions after owning the vehicle for that long. Uh, I've towed with it, commuted with it, done highway trips with it. I talk about likes, dislikes, and I also address some of the major kind of uh, observations I've seen from other reviews. And I give my opinion of those. In this video, I wanna touch on anything I've missed. And I also want to address whether they're positive or negative, some of the major things I've seen in the, in the comments sections, some of the major themes. So that's all the intent is with this video. I've got, uh, I'm, I'm closing in on 3,000 miles now. It's about, it's about a month later from the part one video. So let's dive in. So by far the most frequent comment I'm seeing about this vehicle is the new twin turbocharged V6 engine that Toyota has made available here. No longer can you get the 5.7 naturally aspirated V8. And I'm not really sure what to say here. I totally understand why a lot of people are upset about that V8 not being an option anymore. They really fine-tuned it over the years and got it to be pretty darn reliable. And it put out uh, very respectable horsepower and torque numbers as well. I can only imagine how well that engine would have done paired to this new 10-speed transmission. More on that in a little bit. But in the end, I'm not really sure what to say here. Either, either you, trust, you trust Toyota's engineers and their long-term plans, or, or you don't. Um, I, I'm kind of fully bought in on this engine platform, and I'll, I'll tell you, I do know that this thing makes more horsepower than the outgoing naturally aspirated V8, and it makes way more torque. And I bought this truck specifically for towing. I've got uh, a, a video out on the camper that I tow. It's basically this uh, seven by 16 cargo trailer, seven foot height. So it's, you know, I'm typically towing around 3,500 pounds to, uh, to 4,000 pounds, on, at least on a regular basis. And the thing is just enormously tall. So it's catching a lot of wind. So this truck, when I'm pulling that trailer up hills, I'm just, barely getting up to 2000 RPM and that's up climbing like slight grades. If I actually have to climb a real hill, I might get up to 2500 RPM because there's so much torque available down low. So you're, you're really not stressing the engine too much uh, unless you need to really tip into the throttle and like execute a pass or something like that. But so Time will tell about the reliability of this thing. I'm, I'm not gonna pretend to be, to be a, an engine builder or a master mechanic or an engineer or anything like that. I'm just kind of putting my trust into Toyota. So far, I've been extremely happy with this engine. Maybe none of these turbos will ever see 100,000 miles, or maybe you'll get tons of examples of this twin turbo V6 making it to 200,000 plus miles with just regular maintenance again. Time will tell, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I know the answer. Surprisingly, I'm seeing next to no comments at all about this 10-speed uh, automatic transmission, nor the 331 rear end. I think uh, that combination really allows you to, to pull heavy because they give you some, some pretty low first gears. And uh, with that kind of a gear spread, you're getting great power and torque, but also really good fuel economy. The only comment I have about this 10-speed auto is that on ultra cold mornings, I mean, well below freezing, as you're pulling out of the neighborhood, it's a little bit sluggish shifting gear sometimes, but that's, that's kind of the nature of all automatic transmissions. So I completely understand that some people have had or are having some quality control issues. So I do not want to discredit those valid claims, but most people, myself included, are having no issues at all. In fact, I personally have had zero issues with the interior nor the exterior fit and finish, nor have I had any like noise, vibration, or harshness related issues that I can tell. So in my initial video, I talked about the subscription services that are available for this vehicle and how Toyota gives you a free trial period for a lot of things. And then when those trial periods wear off, you have to pay for those services if you, if you want them. So I just want to provide a little bit of clarification. Now, before I even start that, you could navigate to Toyota's website 
And uh, through there, you can clearly look at all the subscription services and how long their trial periods are for every individual vehicle broken down by a model year. It's actually a really clean and easy to digest PDF that they've got. So that's where I got this. So I'm gonna to refer to my notes a little bit, but I just wanted to clarify that, uh, see you do get some subscriptions with this truck and some of them are Toyota Safety Connect and also Toyota Service Connect. So you've got some sort of safety features like you can ring up Toyota and get roadside assistance or you can control some of the features of the truck through an app on your phone through Service Connect. Some of those have a trial period. Um, some of those are up to 10 years, the trial periods, but most of them are a year or less. Remote Connect is another uh, trial period that lasts one year, and I believe that is where your remote start uh, system uh, resides in the remote connect features. Again, through the app from your phone, you can remote start the truck, or you can use your key fob and click the lock button three times and hold. And after one year, that feature goes away. Now, I'll admit, I am not 100% sure if the key fob remote start feature goes away after that one year. I don't know if you can keep that one or if you just lose the uh, the remote start through the phone. And there's other trial periods you get as well. There's like a Wi-Fi hotspot trial period you get for one month. I never used that. Of course, Sirius XM uh, at satellite radio is a three month trial, but that subscription is through a different company if you want Sirius XM, after that trial period, you contact Sirius XM, not Toyota. So here's my beef with subscriptions. To me, it's a slippery slope. All of a sudden, you're paying $8 a month to have app features to be able to remote start and unlock your car. Yes, your key fob will always work. It'll be able to unlock, lock, and do all those features. You're never gonna lose that. But these connective services and things, like, it's a slippery slope. I can live without all of them, no problem. I'm sure you can too. I just don't wanna see auto manufacturers and Toyota is not the only one going down this road of pinching pennies from their customer with these microtransactions and, and monthly services. I don't wanna see it. We've got enough of that already and it's gonna probably keep getting worse in other parts of our lives. We don't need it in our cars. I wanna buy this thing as a tool, the depreciating asset that it is, and use it as such. Not have to pay for certain features. One of the other major kind of complaints that I'm seeing in the comment section and on some of the forums is about seat comfort. Now, I get it, we're, all of our bodies are shaped different, so what fits one person is not gonna fit another. I'm six foot, about 190-ish, and I have had zero issues with seat comfort. In fact, I find the seats very comfortable. I've been on several three, four hour trips in them already, and uh, I, I've just had no issues at all. So I'm not, again, I'm not trying to take away from, from what some other folks are saying, as far as comfort goes, but for me, the durability of the seats and the comfort is top notch. One of the other major questions I'm seeing and uh, questions both on the, in the comments section on some other videos and in the forums are about payload. Some people are a little bit concerned that Toyota might have lower payloads than what's reported in some of their online spec sheets and things, but here's a close up of my sticker right here. This is, again, this is a limited crew cab short box with air suspension. And I do have most of the added on features that you can get. So as you just saw, mine's 1400 pounds. For me and my needs, that's that's perfectly adequate. If I need to, if I really needed like 2000 plus pounds of payload on a regular basis, I would just get a heavy duty truck. So in my part one video, I incorrectly stated that if you get a TRD off-road package, you do not get the active air dam that kind of auto folds down and auto folds up to improve your fuel economy at uh, like highway speeds and things. Well, I guess that's false. I've already had plenty of comments of folks stating that they have the TRD off-road packages and they do have the active air dam. So if you have any questions about that, just uh, kind of check out your spec sheet or, check, or you know, call, call a dealership to see if you actually have it on whatever trim you're looking for. I know that that's pretty important for a lot of folks who are really intending to off-road these vehicles. 
They just don't want to have to deal with the air dam. I understand. So I hesitate to even really talk about fuel economy because it's so subjective. It really depends on what kind of elevation are you at? Are you towing? How fast do you drive? How hard do you drive? Are you, have you modified your vehicle at all? What's your commute like? This and that. So I'll just share with you briefly my experience. Now I've only had this truck in winter months. It's rated at 17 city, 22 highway. And on my commute, which is a pretty, pretty solid mix, I'm seeing right around 18 and a half to 20 mpgs on average it just really depends on am i a little late that day or or what now on the warmer days i'm seeing uh much closer to that 20 area and then on the really really frigid mornings well below zero i'll get maybe like 17 and a half 18 at the most for my round trip commute now uh highway mileage I think in the summer months when it's a little bit warmer, you're going to easily see that 22 highway uh, economy rating. However, I think you're probably going to have to be like going the speed limit. So here in Virginia, we got speed limits of up to 70 miles per hour. If I stick to 70 on a warm day, I'm getting really good fuel economy. But you tip in, you tip into that throttle more and you get up to like 80 plus or whatever, you're, you're probably not going to see those kinds of numbers. On that note too, on that commute, if I get into that RPM range and I really dig into those turbos, I'm not seeing the, uh, the advertised average fuel economy rating, but that's kind of to be expected. Um, I mean, that's just the na nature of turbocharged engines, right? The, this is the same thing with the Ford EcoBoost 3.5. It's either all, all boost or all eco, right? But um, as far as towing goes, my experience is only with a large box trailer. So on a couple of trips so far, I've seen anywhere from about 10 to about 12 and a half MPG, and I am keeping up with the flow of traffic on the highway. So I think you can do a little bit better than that, especially if you have a, a smaller trailer. Um, but yeah, obviously your results are gonna vary. So I briefly wanna touch on the air suspension and uh, some of the complaints out there about the harsh ride. Those are very true complaints. So when these trucks come from the dealership, they're kind of, at least with the air suspension version, they're set to where the bump stops are riding maybe an inch and a half to two inches right off the, the axle. So if you do hit a harsh bump or something like uh, at speed, you're going to be bouncing off those bump stops and it's very abrupt. Now, there's an easy fix to that. These air suspensions have these little slider adjusters up underneath on the inside of the uh, the act or on the inside of the frame there you can't miss it it's very obvious you just go in there it takes two minutes per side you loosen up that 10 millimeter nut on each side you can adjust the slider setting on each side and that will automatically set the level position for the air suspension i did that i moved each one just like a couple of millimeters it increased the ride height in the rear about a half an inch i did some measurements and it all but eliminated any rough ride issues that I had. So that's an easy fix to some of the folks with air suspension. If you do think that you have a very rough ride and it's bouncing off the bump stops, it takes five minutes and a 10 millimeter socket and, and you're done. So I briefly wanna talk about tires for this truck, specifically for the 20 inch rim. Now this comes with some Bridgestone Dueler HTs. They're just a basic all season MNS rated tire. I'm perfectly happy with them so far. No, I haven't put them in, through anything extreme, so I can't really talk about that. They tow fine, they commute fine, nothing significant to report there. But I will say that tires in this size are hard to find. There's not a lot of variety out there and they're extremely expensive. This is the 265-60 R20. And when you go onto a site like Tire Rack or Simple Tire, Tires in the size are very tough to find. I think there's only like 30 listed on a company like Tire Rack, and they're, most of them are E-rated. Now I get it if you're trying to tow really heavy or you're going off-roading and you're worried about uh, like sidewall punctures and stuff, you go ahead and get that E-rated tire. I'm gonna stick with the standard load tire rating for this truck, just because I wanna retain that factory fuel economy, and power delivery and I don't want to wear anything out too prematurely like bearings and things so I'll be sticking with that but 
just an observation that the 265 60R20s are hard to find and extremely expensive if you jump one size up, which I might end up doing to save a few bucks, the 275 60R20 tires are plentiful, tons of different options, and they're a lot cheaper too. So this stock size tire is approximately a 32 and a half inch tire, and the 275 60R20s are about 33. So you'll gain a half an inch of overall diameter, not really too big of a deal. Uh, so that's something I might do in the future just to save a, like 300 bucks on a set of tires when it comes time, something to consider. So I wanna take you into the interior, talk about some of the safety systems, talk about the camera systems, and kind of explain some of those features and share my opinions on that. I briefly wanna talk about what is called sequential shift. It's the little S here on your shifter. So you can shift into drive and then pull it over to sequential shift mode, which lights up blue. Now, what this will do is show you on your dash, I'm gonna get in real close. There we go, holy shnikes, that's a tight squeeze. You see that little S4, that's sequential shift four? Now you can change through six, seven, all the way up to 10 by just pushing up and down on your uh, gear shifter here. Now, what's that? what that's doing, it's not selecting an individual gear for you. So it's not as if you are using a proper manual mode. What this is doing is limiting the series of gears that you are allowed to access. So for instance here, I'm on sequential six. That means the truck is gonna lim limit you from one to sixth gear. So this is great for something like towing, which tow haul mode kind of does anyways, but if you want to manually use engine braking, you can go down hills and leave it in sequential six and it won't ever go above sixth gear, unless you're in some kind of like an emergency and it's trying to protect the engine, then it will upshift for you. But this essentially just limits the highest gear the truck will enter in automatic mode. So I briefly want to talk about the 360 degree camera system just in case any of you are interested in getting it. It is an option on a lot of trim levels. You select it by hitting this button here or it'll come on automatically if you're parking in a tight spot or something like that. But this is kind of the screen that you're greeted with. Now you do get a nice 360 degree option which is great for parking in tight spots but you also have a lot of different other camera options. I won't go through them all. There's plenty of other videos, but one of my favorites, aside from the uh, front facing front fenders and uh, rear facing rear fenders, all you off-roaders are probably gonna really appreciate that. You also have a front facing camera for off-roading. It's uh, my favorite one's probably, uh, well, you've got the standard backup camera, which is great for lining up a hitch, but it's this truck bed view. So this truck bed view is handy because when you're flying down the highway and say you've got a load back there, I commonly put dirt bikes in the back, gas cans and things like that. So when you're cruising down the highway, you can check on your load just by tapping this button. When you're, when you're cruising and you hit that button, it'll automatically bring up your bed view. So you can do a quick check on your load back there. And what that does after about a few seconds is it'll kind of turn that view off and go right right back to your maps and your music and everything or you can just kind of turn it on and off real quickly so with this part of the video i just want to show you how these proximity sensors work i'm going to pull up close to this crv here and you'll see how the camera system will turn on automatically as you get closer to a vehicle as if you're parking or something now notice here in the top right corner it's telling you where it's coming from So I will uh, reverse out of here to get rid of that annoying beep. But in the 360 degree view, it'll tell you at which part the, uh, the obstruction is. So if you're backing up in a parking garage and you've got a pole that, or an obstacle that you can't see on your back left corner, it'll indicate to you, hey, the obstacle's in your back left corner. The same thing for rear cross traffic alert. If you're pulling out of a, reversing out of a parking spot and there's a car that's coming, flying through the parking lot behind you and you don't see it, it'll indicate to you left or right on the screen here where that car is coming from and it'll automatically break for you if need be. I've had that happen once and I was so glad it did because I would have pulled out right in front of this car 
that was obviously going way too fast in a parking lot you know don't do, don't be doing that come on now next i want to briefly touch on the lane trace assist or lane keep assist or whatever they call it in these toyotas basically it's selected by this button here on the steering wheel and i'll press it here in just a second you'll see it pop up on the screen right there so you'll see the two lane markers pop up and all that's going to do for you is to help keep you in your lane now if you just press it once without any cruise control features on all it's going to do is kind of uh very gently ping pong you off the uh the lanes and keep you in it now it's, it's not going to send you from lane to lane if you uh, if you're encroaching on the left hand lane it will um just ease you back into the center of the lane and, and, and it's not gonna ping pong you back and forth. Now, if you do hit the radar cruise control feature uh, and you're operating radar cruise control with your lane keep assist, it will do actual lane centering around curves and everything. So you just have to gently hold the steering wheel barely at all and it'll, han it'll handle all the steering for you, assuming it has clear visibility of the actual lane markers. Now I did have to turn my feature on, my lane centering feature on from the, from the factory, but that's easily handled through all these different menu options. These are the buttons that control this screen here, and you can go in and turn on and off all your safety features for just to pick the ones you like and don't like. One quick note for the radar cruise control. I forgot, you do have to activate it by hitting your cruise control button and it says radar cruise control active. Now you've got two different features. I'm gonna get you in nice and close here. So this, uh, this little green indicator in the top right corner with the vehicle and then the speedometer and the arrow, that is your regular radar cruise control. If you want the old school cruise control that we all grew up with, well, maybe some of y'all didn't grow, grow up with that. You just hold your regular cruise control button down. Come on, baby. Don't embarrass me. You hold it down and it'll go to the traditional cruise control. They call that constant speed cruise control. So if you have a preference for one or the other, you get your choice. Now, for anybody who is a little bit hesitant about this screen being too big, I will say that when I first saw it, I was like, oh, wow, that's a huge screen, 14 inches, whatever it is, 14, 14.1, but you get used to it so fast. In my opinion, this screen does not obstruct your view at all. It is not distracting at all. In fact, now when I get into other cars with like normal size screens that are still decently big they all look super small to me it's not it's not an ego thing or nothing it's just uh, your eyes just get used to certain things i like having the big screen you can have your maps and your music up at the same time and it just makes life easier to me it's not a distractor at all it's uh it's just a great tool to have so one of the last features I want to show you in the, on the interior is this electronic parking brake feature. So these trucks have electronic parking brakes and I'll do my best to show you a close up of that mechanism. Uh, from what I hear, they are very reliable and it's a very simple parking brake system. Shouldn't have any issues with it. Well, one of the cool things you can do is you can press this hold button. Now, for those of you do, that live in the city, you can see the parking brake hold feature just came up right there and I'll put it in drive. So you can see now it says right here, there's a, a, an orange hold sign that just popped up. That means that the, the parking brake is currently holding the vehicle. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner there, I've got the vehicle in drive. So if I just tap the accelerator ever so slightly with my foot, it takes it off. Now it still indicates that the parking feature is available with the green symbol, but now it's holding the vehicle. So this is great for long stoplights. You got that that two minute stoplight in town that you caught, or say you live in the city or the suburbs and you're catching red lights all over the place. It's just a, a, a little convenience comfort feature you can use. And again, here I'll tap the accelerator. And now I'm pressing the brake. And once that orange hold sim symbol comes on, I can take my foot off and just rest my feet at the bottom of the footwell and then take off when you're ready. I really like the feature. Didn't think I would actually like it that much, but I do. It's just a comfort thing. So in conclusion, thank you for watching everybody. Uh, that kind of concludes my review, at least of the initial ownership experience of this truck. Perhaps I'll make another review in uh, maybe a year or two when I've got quite a few more miles underneath it. Thanks for watching.